Gary mentioned, my name is Nick Valonis, and I'm president of a company called the Educational Training Institute. And this presentation will be about a half an hour long, and it's really a prelude to um, a larger presentation that's going to take place on Sunday before the, before the TUG conference at 2.30 in the afternoon. Um, so essentially, if you like what you hear here, um, you'll probably really enjoy the, um, the presentation that we're going to do on that Sunday just before you do your presentations or conduct your SIG meetings. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I have been a trainer for 30 years, and I've trained uh, a lot of different things from presentation skills to uh, train the trainer programs in mostly glove trained software. So I'm more of a technical person than anything. Um, eight years ago, eight and a half years ago, I uh, began a career in uh, IT with a uh, plumbing and heating distributor in Massachusetts, and that's how I got involved with TUG. And during those eight years of my involvement with TUG, I was a TUG presenter. So I've, I've kind of done the things that you're about to do and know the audience to some degree that you're going to be speaking to uh, come May. And then uh, I was a SIG leader for just under two years, and so I've conducted two SIG meetings, and they are, were very interesting and a very positive experience for me and hopefully a positive experience for uh, the people that attended. Um, and last August, I'm very proud to say I became an iPhone user. Uh, we got a free iPhone upgrade on our family plan and my 15-year-old daughter was livid that she didn't get the iPhone, that I was going to take it because I know nothing about technology and I won't utilize that iPhone. Um, so what happened was when I got the iPhone, she took it immediately and did something to it. And when I got it back, my iPhone looked like this. And uh, that's my 15-year-old daughter's face of her disdain that I got the iPhone before she did, and she had to wait a year for the for the next upgrade. Uh, now, um, what I want to talk about today very quickly are really six things, and it, it comes down to the word cuddle. Um, there are these six things that I think every new presenter or even experienced presenter should be thinking about before they go into their presentation. And the first C stands for a comfortable environment. It's very simple. People do not learn, people do not receive information if they're not comfortable and if they're not safe. And that is just a truism that I've seen for 30 years. Uh, number two, if you understand a little bit about adult learning theory, and I'm certainly not an adult learning theorist, but I know a little bit about adult learning theory, and the little that I do know, when I utilize that knowledge in my presentations, I know that my presentations go much better than they would if I didn't understand really the basics of how adults learn. Uh, number three, develop presentation skills. Uh, I've seen presenters that say, hey, listen, the most important thing that happens is what I tell people and they don't really give enough credence to how the information is delivered by them to their audience. And the delivery is, is brutally important. Um, I have a video, um, and I'm going to see if I can run it now to show you just really what I mean by that. And it looks like I can't. Oh, there we go. Nick, this is a great list of things that we're going to tell our session monitors to be on the lookout for. Uh, so, I, I wonder, Gary, do you think people actually heard the, the audio on that? 
No, I don't think so, but I was glad okay. that the writing was there because uh, <laughs> yeah. point well taken. Yeah, I made you. I made you. Um, so the, your presentation skills are, are instrumental at getting your point across and getting your a point across effectively. And that video certainly pointed out some do's and don'ts. I, I, I look at that and I kind of chuckle, but when I first started presenting 30 years ago, there are some of the things in that video that I did, and to be quite honest, if someone pointed it out to me, I wouldn't say that I did that. I would disagree with them vehemently, and I would be wrong. And so the video portion of uh, just a two-minute video of you doing your introduction or doing a particular concept within your presentation, I think is instrumental to helping you really think about your presentation style, your presentation skills and things that you may do to deal with stress that you want to curtail, you want to change so that they don't become an encumbrance to the communication that you make uh, during your tug presentation or, or during a SIG meeting. Um, the second D is for develop presentation tools. Um, the first tool I want to talk about is everyone thinks that there's death by PowerPoint. I'm not a believer in that. I think some people overuse PowerPoint or some people don't use PowerPoint effectively, but I think it's an incredible tool, especially when you use it effectively or just relatively effectively. Um, so I am an advocate for that, as well as some other techniques. Um, number f uh, five, uh, the L is for learn by doing. People learn best when they do it. In, in a presentation, you think to yourself, you'd struggle to get people to do stuff because really it's an inactive process. You're sitting in a chair, you're listening to someone who's a SME, a subject matter expert, and you're hopefully getting it verbally, hopefully visually, but learn by doing is the most powerful. And so you want to be thinking about how can I get a learn by doing environment in your presentation. Sometimes it can be done and sometimes you really struggle to get it done. And then lastly, um, the E is for enrich with good questioning. I am a person that if I'm presenting to 100 people, will still ask questions of that audience. And I know there are a lot of people who say, I have a big presentation. I have uh, you know, 150 people in it. I'm not going to be able to diverge and ask the group a question and get responses. And if you don't feel comfortable doing it, please don't. But I'm an advocate that says engage the audience, no matter how big the audience is. Uh, uh, there's not a tug audience that I've seen that I would not feel or I'd feel uncomfortable about trying to engage them with, with questioning. I'm a big advocate for that. Um, so let's talk about creating a comfortable learning environment. I'm going to do a, an intro to my Microsoft Excel session that I'm doing at tug uh, in May. And it's going to go like this. Uh, good morning. My name is Nick Valonis, and I am with the Educational Training Institute, and the course you're in today is everything you need to know about Microsoft Excel to be a professional. My credentials, I've been training Excel and helping people become power users of Excel for the last uh, 22 years, and before that I actually used a pro program that preceded it called Lotus 123. And for about five to seven years, I, I helped people become power users of that product. And this course is really going to help define the things that every user should know, and it's really going to help you become the go-to person within your organization with Excel, so that people come to you with Excel questions, because you're going to have knowledge that most people don't want. Now, if you think about that presentation, or excuse me, that introduction that I just did, I really did three things. Number one, I introduced myself, hopefully in a comfortable way, facing my audience with my hands down, not in my pocket, my palms forward, in a non-threatening, easy way for people to understand, hey, listen, he's starting, and his name is Nick Valonis, and he's with a company called the Educational Training Institute. Number two, I gave them my credentials. And not only did I just say I've been doing this for a long time and gave the number of years, but I told them that I help people not learn Excel, but turn them into power users. And that's a powerful statement because that's what I do. I don't just teach people Excel. I teach them how to do things that, that, that not, not a lot of people know how to do, to be quite honest. And then number three, I threw in the hook. And the hook was, 
if you go to this presentation and if you listen to these 15 things I'm about to teach you, you will become a go-to person within your organization. So I think that any introduction needs to, number one, get the attention of the audience completely, introduce your name and your organization, and then number two, talk about your credentials, not just in how long you've been doing it, but how you've been doing it. To what effectiveness have you done it? And then number three, it should have a hook. And the hook is, listen, this is what's going to happen after you're done with this SIG meeting, after you're done with this one-hour presentation on, 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 on an ERP system, for example. Um, the second thing you can do to get people to be comfortable is you can have them find out about the person next to them. Um, uh, in a SIG meeting that I once had, the first thing I had people do is introduce themselves to the person next to them, grew up in, group up in pairs of two, and find out the person's full name, their birthplace, and the one thing they want to learn from this SIG meeting, the one thing they want out of this SIG meeting. Now, there were a few people in the audience that didn't know uh, anyone. It was their first SIG meeting, and that was probably the best thing I could have done for many reasons, but namely, that I got everyone comfortable. They didn't have to think about the person sitting next to them. Are uh, they going to get along? Is, that, is he a nice person? They found out immediately. And all of a sudden, all these conversations took place because when you find out where someone was born, you probably have a relative that lives somewhere close, or you probably have been to that location or pretty darn close to it, or you're probably interested in that location. So that three to five minutes was well worth the time of helping people get comfortable with their environment. Um, characteristic of adult learning. I don't have time to go through this entire slide, but I do want to talk about this right here, resistance to memorization. Oh, let me go back. Resistance to memorization. Adults resist this at all cost. My children can get a telephone number from directory assistance and they will memorize it the first time through and they'll recite it to me and if I didn't get it they'll recite it again without any problem. If I have to remember a directory assistance telephone number I have to listen to it twice and hopefully I write it down and then sometimes I still miss it so I get it uh, text, texted to me on, on my cell phone. It's just amazing how I resist memorization. Now if adults are like this and we realize that adult learners are like this, when you're doing your presentations that means that you should respect that. Um, and let me show you, uh, uh, well, let me give you an example of this. So um, think about the Great Lakes and, and think about the names of the Great Lakes and could you name the Great Lakes to yourself. Now, I was not able to get all five of the Great Lakes until someone said to me, think of the homes around the Great Lakes. And if you think of the homes around the Great Lakes, it will help you know that it's an acronym for all five Great Lakes. H for Huron, O for Ontario, M for Michigan, E for Erie, S for Superior. So what a great little technique to help people memorize information that you want them to memorize and it just makes it so darn darn easy. Um, the second thing that you need to uh, to know about adult learners is that they really like the, primers, uh, the primary and the recency effect. Um, and I don't really want to talk about what that means, and if you don't know what it means now, you will in just a moment. So I want to uh, do a quick little exercise. Um, on the board or on your screen, I'm going to uh, put up some, some uh, words, and I want you to try to memorize as many words as you can in one minute. And you can't write any of these words down, so no paper, no pen, no photography. I want you to just do it all through memorization. And I want you to try to memorize as many as you can.
Now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take a piece of paper and a pencil. If you're in a car listening to this, obviously uh, just skip this whole thing. Uh, but if you're not, I'd like you to quickly, within the next 20 seconds, write down as many of the words as you can remember. Write down as many of the words as you can remember. Now I can't actually ask all of you because I don't have the audio on, but I would bet that most people on their list will have the word apple. And the reason why they'll have the word apple is it's the first word or the first thing that you tried to memorize. And I would guess that many of you, a higher percentage than any other word, would have the word cement or the last word you got to. So if you were memorizing this and you got to the word square, you'd have the word square as the last. And that's really the epitome of the primary recency effect. The primary, you remember the first thing you hear. The recency, you remember the most recent or last thing that you heard. And so what does that mean for adult learners? That you want to give them a lot of primary and recency effects. Now, in the course of a, a SIG meeting, that's easy. It's important to take breaks because every time you take a break, you get a primary and a recency. When the person comes back, you hit them with some information. They're going to remember, remember it more often because it was the most recent thing. And you get more recency, uh, excuse me, primary effects and you get more recencies because you have a, a break on the other, on the, the other end. Um, the other word that I think you probably got is Zulu, and I bet you most people would have gotten that because it's just such a unique word and people like uniqueness. Um, also, there's a lot of different techniques that people have used to try to memorize the words. They tell themselves a story or what have you. Um, but the important thing here is that you really want to help people memorize the information and knowing that there are primary and recency effects can certainly help you with that. Now, let's talk about roadblocks to communications. I'd love to be able to ask you all this, but I, I obviously I can't hear the answers yet, but at the end maybe I'll ask you when we open up the audio. Um, how many people are nervous about doing their presentation? My guess is that many of you probably are not nervous, but certainly apprehensive. Now, I've been training for 30 years, and every single time I go into a situation and I'm going to train, I am almost nervous, certainly definitely apprehensive. Um, I am amazed when I learned this, and I almost didn't believe it, but I've now seen enough surveys for it. But when you ask a thousand people, and I don't care if it's just in the United States or whether it's in Europe or whether it's in Asia, or whether it's in Africa or whether it's in South America, if you ask them their biggest fears, you'll get things like fear of insects, fear of disease, fear of heights. But always and everywhere, the number one fear will be public speaking. 41% of the people surveyed, and it's pretty consistent across cultures, are that's their biggest fear, and they fear it more than the 19% who fear death. I find that amazing, but it's, it's true. But it's also comforting for us, because we know that if we have 100 people in our presentation, 41% of them would not trade with us for anything. And so that certainly brings comfort to me, knowing that 41% are really unwilling or just would not want to be in the situation that I'm in of actually making that presentation. Um, a lot of presenters think they have to be perfect. I don't think you have to be perfect. You have to be prepared, you have to have planned, and you have to have practiced. But you don't need to be perfect. Some of the best presentations I've ever done is when I haven't been perfect, to be quite honest. Um, and then how do I deal with the fear? Um, let's do a quick little exercise. Oops. Um, if you don't mind, if you're not driving but you're in your office, I want you to close your eyes. Um, yes, I really want you to close your eyes. And I want you to 
to think of a beautiful beach on an island in the Caribbean or in Hawaii, and you're on that beach with the beautiful sunshine, the ripples of the waves coming in over the sand, and I want you to think that you just won the U.S. lottery for $275 million. $275 million you just won. Every financial concern you ever had is now no longer a burden. Now, I'd like to ask you, but I can't, but I guess that many of you are probably sweating a little bit. Certainly your heart rate would go up a little bit if you won the lottery, $270 million. Um, you're certainly maybe perspiring, um, uh, maybe uh, um, your, uh, uh, let's say, facial expressions are, are, are pretty excited. Your um, heart rate is up, your blood pressure is up. Um, these are all the, the physical things that happen. And if you think about it, when you're about to make a presentation, I feel almost the exact same physical symptoms. I'm definitely, my heart is racing. I am perspiring to some degree. I do feel tension and not in my stomach. And those are all the same physical attributes that I really had when I won the lottery. And so what's the difference? It's really just a matter of perspective. And so when you think about the fear before you start, think about, hey, listen, this is number one, an opportunity to, for me to, to, to shine, if you will, and 41% of the people wouldn't trade places with me for, for anything. Um, now, as far as uh, using the body more effectively, um, I want you to look at this slide for a second and think, and I would suspect that you're probably thinking, what in the world is Nick Valonis talking about in this slide? And if you look at these slide items, you have probably what complete confusion. What is he going to talk about? What I'm doing with this slide is creating something called cognitive dissidence. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you what that means just through a little exercise. And I guess I'll have to do it with Gary. Gary, can you hear me? Yep, I'm right here. Okay, so Gary, I got a question for you. Um, do okay. you consider yourself a generous person? Sometimes. Okay, so you do, essentially, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, second question, do you give a lot of money to charity? Yes. Okay. So you have a belief that you're generous, and you have a reality belief that you do give a lot of money to charity, and so those things are in consist or they're consistent with each other. And so there's really no cognitive dissidence between those two beliefs because they're they're connected. Now I've asked people this question before and they said, yeah, I think I'm really generous. Have you ever given any ch uh, to charities? No, I never have. And that creates tension because there is cognitive dissonance at that point because there's an inconsistency between the two beliefs. With this slide, I think I've become a better presenter and a more effective presenter because I've created cognitive dissonance. People in my audience, the 100 people, are thinking, what in the world is he going to talk about? The person who was a little bit bored or, 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 or about to go to sleep on me now just wakes up and says, what? 7% do you believe? 7% 7, 7 of what? And all of a sudden now I have this anticipation because people don't want to have cognitive dissonance. They want consistency. And so they're going to strive now for me to answer this so that they can get rid of the cognitive dissonance. Okay, so let's do that. So. 7% do you believe? Here's what it is. I believe that 7% of the quality and effectiveness of your presentation at TUG will be due to the words that you choose. Let me say that again. 7% of your effectiveness at the TUG presentation will be the words that you choose. That means 93% will not have anything to do with the words that you choose, and that 93% will be nonverbal communication. And if you break down that 93%, it will be roughly 38% due to the tonal quality of your voice. Do you project your voice well? Do you have good pitch? Do you use inflection? Do you project your voice to the back of the room? 
and 55% of your effectiveness as a tug presenter will be your body language. Will you be making eye contact? Will you be smiling? Will you have your posture in a non-threatening position? Now, the reason why I believe this is because in 1968, a gentleman named Albert Morabian did some studies that essentially what he thought proved this, but then he realized he really didn't prove it. To be quite honest, he did this study that showed people, or said, he would recite words to people, and some of the words had a good connotation, some had bad, and then he showed pictures of people with facial expressions of good and bad, and it was much more effective when people saw the pictures of, instead of the words. And so his study essentially said, listen, this is true. The words are not as important, it's how it's presented, whether it be vocally or whether it be through body language. Now, his study was really all about emotion, and so the communications and, and, and presentation people took this, ran with it, and if you talk to anyone, they will recite these statistics for you. To be quite honest, I don't completely believe them. And there have been other studies that said that Albert Morabian's uh, work and his book, Silent Messages, is really not true. But what these, every study does show is that the words are definitely secondary. So sometimes it's not 7%, sometimes it's up to maybe 30% of the words are the most effective thing in your presentation, but it's always between 70 and 93% of the effectiveness of your presentation is nonverbal. Now, what does that mean? It means that really you should be practicing in front of a mirror when you do your presentation, and you definitely, if you have the opportunity, should be videotaped so that you can see your nonverbal cues and improve them or take ones that are really negative and just alleviate them all together. Um, number two, alax is a word that I made up. You want to be two things, relaxed and alert. You as the presenter want that and also you want your presentees, the people in the audience, you want them alert but you also want them relaxed as well. Um, why I like Johnny Carson. Um, when I first did my first training back in the 1980s, I was videotaped and my right arm had all the tension in the world and it every 14 to 15 seconds would do this really freak show of a move. I wish I could actually show it to you, um, but I don't have a video clip of it. Um, but that's where all my tension was. And so what do I do? I did like Johnny Carson. I put my right hand in my right pocket. Not a nice visual to start a presentation, but I had to because it was certainly was better than my, my hand flailing every 14 to 15 seconds and people counting how many times I did it in a minute and taking, uh, making bets on it. Um, and when I put my hand in my pocket like Johnny Carson, after four or five minutes I finally got comfortable enough to bring that hand out of my pocket and start using hand gestures. Nice little trick, Johnny Carson is the, the pro at it. Um, and so my fellow Americans, um, let me uh, try to be, uh, or let me pretend I'm JFK for a moment and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you that portion of the speech. Uh, and so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And that's what he said. Now I'm going to say it again a little differently and hopefully it's a little bit more powerful. And so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. The only difference between those two ways of saying that same f set of phrases is that I paused twice the second time. And the pause was critical. It actually brought power to the entire section of that speech. And if you listen to JFK give it, his pause was, was instrumental. Now what does the pause do? Oh, it does so many things for a presenter. Number one, it allows you to breathe, and you need oxygen in your lungs to produce good voice. And number two, it makes exclamation points on what you say. It makes it emphatic. It's like a gigantic exclamation point that this was really, really important. So don't be afraid to pause. Just like I did there, to get your point across probably one of the most important things I think that a presenter can do. Um, 
Who is Doris Kearns Goodwin? Doris Kearns Goodwin is a very famous historian uh, writer She's from uh, New Hampshire. And she actually worked uh, on the staff of Lyndon Baines Johnson. And uh, she is, I think, my favorite historian. Um, she's riveting. One day, about oh, 12, 13 years ago, she was presenting at a local hall in Massachusetts. And my wife and I wanted to go see her. So we went to this place called the Davisport Yacht Club, about seven to 800 people, and big dinner. And she got up on the podium, and she made a presentation that was riveting. I was right in the middle table of these seven to eight hundred people and I was facing her directly and I could not take my eyes off of her because I find her to be so insightful and interesting. Now, the night is over. I say to my wife, I'd really like to meet her. She's like, I would too. And so we went and we waited and waited and waited and finally met her. And Doris Kearns Goodwin shakes my hand and she looks me in the eye and says, do I know you? And I said, no, no, my name's Nick Filonis. I think you're fantastic. I read your book on LBJ. It was just riveting. She goes, you sure I don't know you? And I said, no. She goes, are you from New Hampshire? And I said, no, no, I'm from Massachusetts. Then, then why were you staring at me the whole presentation? And I said, what? And she said, you were looking right at me as if you knew me. And I was blown away that somehow this master presenter historian was able to pick out some, some, some friendly eyes in an audience of seven to 800 people. But as a presenter, she did that. And that is really important. When you start your presentation and you're making eye contact with people, look for friendly eyes. Look for people that are looking at you intently, that want to, want to learn from you and want to hear what you have to say, because it's going to make you really, really comfortable. And number two, just as important, it's going to endear you to the audience, because you can look them right in the eye. Um, the next one, um, I did not say I ate the cookies. Uh, I'm going to say this phrase three times. And each time, I think it's going to mean something different to you. I did not say I ate the cookies. Essentially, I'm saying, I didn't say it, but I might have thought it. All right, how about this one? I did not say I ate the cookies. I might have thrown them at people, but I didn't eat them. And lastly, I did not say I ate the cookies. I ate the brownies, but I didn't eat the cookies. So it's one set of words, and it means three completely different things. And it was all done through the art of inflection. And we use inflection in our voice constantly, and it helps us to make really important points with people, to get across really interesting, difficult concepts. And we do it naturally, and as a presenter, don't ever be afraid to do it, and actually do it to the nth degree, because it is important. Um, Joe Bennett Baby, um, I don't know if any of you know Joe Bennett. I've only met him three or four times, but he is one of the most enthusiastic speakers at a tug conference. Uh, he just blew me away the first time I saw him, and it was his enthusiasm that just got me. And so I throw his name in here because I think being enthusiastic, being upbeat, using as much energy as you can is really important to help engage your audience. Um, and then lastly, uh, pick a person, any person. Um, there are really four different types of presenters. There's the presenter that's new, that has trouble facing uh, his or her audience. Uh, number two, there's the presenter that will face the audience, but will look just above their heads as he or she presents because they don't want to make eye contact. And then number three, there's the experienced presenter that will certainly look at people and hopefully not use darting eyes trying to look at everyone in the audience, but will make eye contact with people as they present. And then number four, there's the masterful presenter. And that masterful presenter has the ability to make a presentation and make every person in the presentation feel like the presentation is only in jest for them. And the person who's able to do this is, is Bill Clinton. Now, and whether you liked his politics or not, he was masterful at, at making everyone in the audience feel like this is all about them. And they 
I was asked once, Bill, how do you do it? And he said very easily, I just pick a person in the audience and I make contact with them through eye, eye contact and I, I talk to them, I present to them. And then after 15 to 20 or 30 seconds, I'll go to another person that has friendly eyes and I will talk to just them. And so it makes the whole presentation so much more personable and so much more personal that he was able to do that. And I recommend that it's something that you should definitely try. Um, seven minute rule. The seven minute rule simply means that you need to surprise people every seven minutes in a presentation. Um, there's been some studies done uh, one study was actually the researchers took juice and they were trying to define if people like apple juice more than orange juice and so they had these guns set up, you had your mouth open or the, the person in the, uh, in the study had their mouth open and every 20 seconds it would shoot the juice in, in the person's mouth and the person would have a reaction of whether they enjoyed it or not and when they did further, or they worked further into the study they found that it really wasn't that they liked the juice or the sweetness of one versus the other, but what they anticipated and loved was the surprise. And so when you started changing the variation of time of when the person got the squirt of juice, the brain started going wild with activity just before in anticipation for the surprise of the, of the, the shot of juice. Well, what we take from this is I think every seven minutes you need to engage your audience and give them a surprise. And it might be a simple surprise where you're teaching someone about, hey, listen, you should change your password. It's very important to change your password because it helps you become more secure and it helps your data become more secure. Or you could throw up an analogy screen and say, hey, passwords are like, like toothbrushes. You should never share them and you should change them off. And, all right, that's a little bit of a surprise because it's an analogy I wasn't expecting. Plus, it's a really powerful analogy for me because I'm not going to share, share my my, my toothbrush with anyone and I do want to change them often and I should be thinking the same way about my passwords. Um, other ways to surprise your audience, use video when you can. Use audio when you can. Tell a, a story that helps, helps get that, that, that difficult concept across about using SQL. Um, stories are extremely powerful, especially when they're personal stories that happen to you professionally. Um, or have people do individual exercises. Um, in uh, all the classes that I teach is really easy because I'm teaching technology and I have people do both individual exercises and group exercises. And so be thinking about your presentation on how you can get people to to do an interactive exercise to get a, a, a point across. Um, and lastly, I'd like to just talk about the art of questions. Um, I find this format that we're doing right now really frustrating because I want to ask questions and I want to get feedback from people and, and I really can't because we don't have the audio um, opened up for everybody. Um, but in, in a live presentation, I'm going to be asking questions over and over and over again and they're always going to be open-ended questions. And an open-ended question is very simply a question that has no right or wrong answer. I am not going to ask someone in a Microsoft Excel class, how many nested if statements can you have? Because there's one right answer and there are a lot of wrong answers and no one's going to want to answer that question because no one wants to appear foolish and have the wrong answer. But I will say questions like, how many people use the VLOOKUP function? And usually half the people would have used that function before. And then I can say, are there any downsides to using it? Now, yeah, there's thousands of downsides to the VLOOKUP function. And then I can talk about what's a better way of actually doing that without using a VLOOKUP function. So open-ended questions. Um, questions to check off understanding. You know what? In this slide, you see 3 plus 2 plus 5. I've asked this question over the last 30 years of people, and I will get that 3 plus 2 plus or times 5 equals 25. And then I'll have other people say, no, nah, it's not 25, it's 13. And the people say 13, I say, no, no, it's really 25. And I try to get them to change their answer to 25. And sometimes I can get them to change their answer to 25. And then sometimes I can get the people who say 25 to change to 13. But there's only one right or wrong answer here. And the right answer, obviously, is 2 times 5 is 10 plus 3 is 13 because of the order of precedence. Now, only reason why I remember the order of precedence is that Sister Teresa, back in fourth or fifth grade, 
had me recite, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. I had to say it over and over again, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. P, anything in parentheses is done first. Excuse, E, anything that's an exponent is done next by multiplication, dear, division, A, Aunt, Sally, addition and subtraction. And so I never forgot order of precedence because of that little story. Um, once again, a real powerful thing. Um, I wish I could set enough, show you a video right now. Um, I can't, but um, if anyone remembers, there's a fantastic part in Ferris Bueller of the teacher uh, asking questions or trying to take a roll call. Uh, Johnson, anyone, anyone? Is Johnson here, anyone? Um, when you ask a question, be real quiet and wait for an answer. And if you have to wait 30 seconds, wait 30 seconds. If someone grunts, use that as an answer and say, yes, I heard you grunt, but that's not the right answer. Um, but when you ask a question, don't answer it right away. And then lastly, if someone asks you a question during the presentation, it means you've engaged them. I, I get really excited about when someone asks a question, and I always restate the question. So um, let's try this out. Hey, Gary, are you still with me? Yep, right here. Hi. Um, Gary, can you uh, um, uh, raise your hand, and then I'll, uh, I want you to ask this question. I want you to say, um, Nick, why don't you use the VLOOKUP function in Excel? Well, I was um, Gary, question? I was going to ask that question, Nick. Why don't you use the VLOOKUP formula in Excel? I use it all the time. Okay. Um, so Gary's question is, why do I not use the IF function? Is that the question, Gary? No, why do you not use the VLOOKUP function? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so Gary's question is, why do you not use the VLOOKUP function? So there's two reasons why I restated the question for everyone to hear. Number one, I may have misunderstood it, and I was thinking if function rather than VLOOKUP, and so Gary can correct me. Number two, no one's going to hear that question the first time through. The person in the back of the room is um, almost asleep, but he or she wants the answer to it. So when I restated it, I grounded everyone in the presentation to, hey, listen, that was the question, and now they're ready for the answer. Now here comes the answer, Gary, if you're interested. VLOOKUP functions are amazingly slow when you have huge data sets over, let's say, 500,000 records. And I work with a lot of big data sets that are over 500,000 records, and so I don't want to sit there wait 17 minutes for this VLOOKUP function to do what it wants. Number two, in a VLOOKUP function, the index column always has to be the first column. And sometimes my data is set up where the index column, the uh, social security number, the uh, invoice number, is not the first column. And so there are two excellent functions, and I'm not going to tell you what they are, that are much better at doing VLOOKUPs. All right, so well, the point I'm trying to get across here is definitely I think try to promote questions from the audience. Definitely repeat the question so that the person can make sure that you understood that that was the question. There's good communication between you and the person asking. And number three, that everyone in the room now hears it a second time and now they're ready for the, for the answer. Um, so what I want to leave you with, um, did I, boy I went way over time, oh, it took me longer to, um, video is a must. I think the most powerful thing I've ever done for me professionally with my presenting was to be videotaped for three to four minutes so that I could see what my body language was sending out, what my voice sounded like, what my facial expressions looked like. Did I smile? Did I have a non-threatening posture? Was my pitch good? Was my projection good? Was my inflection good? Um, you can get this from a videotape. You can't get this really as effectively any other way. And so if you do come to the uh, training in, uh, uh, in May, on May 3rd, uh, we are going to be videotaping people. And I'll tell you, after you get videotaped, making a presentation the next time after that seems so much easier. Uh, just because, yeah, getting videotaped is sometimes can be a scary thing. But you'd be surprised how, how really non-threatening I, I try to make it. Um, so with that, thank you very much for, for taking the time out. And um, Gary, I think um, probably time to, to open up to questions. Hopefully people do have some questions for me. Absolutely. And feel free to write them in the question bank if you like. But I'm also going to unmute everybody. So uh, forewarning, um, if you've got background noise going on, please uh, mute your phone. If you're driving, mute your phone. Um, uh, but otherwise, um, They mute everybody one at a time. But there's only about 14 people on the call, so 
Uh, I'm just going to unmute everybody, and we can open up for questions. So it looks like there's some people that um, didn't enter an access code when they called in, and if you didn't enter an access code, the system won't allow you to speak. I apologize for that. Uh, but everybody else is unmuted, so um, do you have a question you want to throw out at the audience? And by the way, if anybody wants to ask a question, you can raise your hand um, or you can just speak up. Right about now is when I play that um, that audio tape of the crickets that chirp. Okay, I'll give Nick a question. Can All you right. hear me? Yes. This is one one for the history books. Nick, can you name the two spreadsheet spreadsheets that existed before Lotus? <laughs> I can name one of them. Okay. Visicalc. That's right. And oh, one more. Oh, no. I don't know. Apple came out before Lotus, though. Maybe it was. Is that something to do with Apple? Multiplan. Multiplan was Microsoft's first spreadsheet. But Nick, you probably knew that, right? Matt. Hold on, Nick. I'm uh, sorry. Did you mute Nick? I muted Nick. I'm sorry. There. Now oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know what? It was uh, VisiCalc by Dan Bricklin, actually built in uh, Massachusetts. And then um, Multiplan I did use, and I really didn't like it uh, compared to Lotus 1, 2, 3. Um, but that's, that's an awesome question. So, so um, I'm sorry, who is this? <laughs> this is Bob. Hey, I'm Bob. Good. Thank, thank you for the question. Hey, uh, Nick? Yeah. This is Jason with Falkner Haynes. How are you? Hey, good, Jason. How you doing? Doing great. Um, I've good. heard, and if you mentioned this, I missed it, but I've heard conflicting advice on the level of movement um, that you should have when presenting. I've heard some call experts, because they're presenting on presenting, say um, that the best thing is to be relatively stationary with minimal movement but kind of keeps a focal point in the same general area. And I've had others saying that moving really kind of keeps the audience engaged, so going from one place to another, and, um, and it's certainly the size of the room makes a difference, but I was wondering what uh, your opinion was on that. Yeah. Uh, um, first, I think it's an awesome question, and this is certainly just my opinion, and I am not a presentation expert by any means. When I start a presentation, I am, some, I am as still as a mouse, and I am facing forward with my arms at my sides if I can get my right hand out of my pocket. I'm brave enough to do that with kind of my palms facing forward. And I always start with either a good morning or a good afternoon, and I pause and wait for uh, a response. And if I don't get it, I'll, I'll say, hey, good morning, good afternoon, and I'll wait for a response, wait for eye contact, and then I know I got everyone grounded, vested, I now can continue. Now, I don't do a lot of movement during the first oh, three to four minutes. And then, as I get more comfortable, and as the audience gets more comfortable with me, I'm a huge believer that you use as much room as you want. You jump off the podium you want, because people will find movement engaging, because they have to move with you. And they have to. Um, so, I love to move move around the room as 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 much as I feel comfortable, but just not at the beginning. So I guess I kind of I kind of am melding the two together because um, if you move a lot at the beginning, it's almost like an untrusting thing. Why is he moving so much? What isn't he telling me? But once someone establishes a trust level with the presenter or has an, a, a trust level with the presenter, I think movement's a, a great thing. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're very welcome. Thanks for the question. Nick, you ever do a round table? Um, a round table? Yes, I think I did. Do you have any thoughts about you know about, about that? Because you're not really doing a presentation; you're moderating a discussion. Um, so the round table would be there are five subject matter experts and you're one of them and you're moving from person to person uh, giving input on a, on a subject matter? You know, it's more like um, there's a round table, um, how to handle non-stock inventory or how to handle freight in your company. It's just a topic. 
and you're the moderator. So it's one guy, and there's 15 people in the session. Yeah. So, and no video. I mean, it's, it's really more of a discussion than anything else. Um, I think I've been in that situation before, and I think my I view my role as the moderator as the person who makes sure that everyone feels comfortable to give their input, because there will be people in that audience that will feel very, very comfortable about giving their input on that and any other subject matter that that, that they want they want to expose upon. But then there'll be other people that won't be quite as assertive that will have some really valuable input, but you want them to be comfortable. And so my recommendation to the people giving roundtables is, as a moderator is to make sure that you're scanning the room all the time to see who agrees and who disagrees. And if you know the people that are disagreeing and, and you have a comfort level with them, at just saying, hey, listen, Sue, it looks like you may not agree with this. Do you have a different situation with your IBM mainframe or your uh, ERP system or does your backup and recovery system not work that way and then all of a sudden the person very comfortably can give input they don't have to really kind of interject because you help them interject so I think that's probably number one number two I think the moderator should definitely get the thing going or get the round table going and a best way of doing that is saying to people listen I want you to talk to the person next to you, find out their name and why they're having a problem with uh, uh, with pricing within our ERP system. What's the biggest problem with pricing right now? And then you've got people talking amongst themselves. They feel more comfortable with the person next to them, and they're going to be much more willing to give input to the discussion, and they have content right in front of them. They just wrote down what Sally's biggest problem was with pricing. Okay. That makes sense, Gary. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah, you're very, you're very welcome. I guess I want to throw out a question. Um, is there anyone um, who is um, nervous about about doing their SIG or 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 making their presentation? We have a room full of confident people. Boy, we <laughs> do. They don't even want to admit. <laughs> right. They're too nervous to answer the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I, I do this for a living, and I'm, I'm nervous about it. Uh, the, the, the most nervous you'll be is just that, uh, that first 30 seconds. And, and that's why doing that introduction um, can be real important. Remember, people are making value judgments, and they, they make the value judgment within the first 60 seconds of, hey, listen, do I really want to listen or don't I want to listen? So that, that initial point, and remember, when you're nervous, no one knows it unless you show it to them. And so if you can help get your body language really, really calm and really non-threatening, uh, and your voice, same thing, non-threatening, you can you can fake people into thinking that you're completely comfortable when you're really not. Okay. Well, yeah, you, Gary, no, no, no questions came in through the uh, through the uh, hand raising, right? Um, hold on, I think one did. Yeah. I oh, okay. Attention, I'm sorry. Um, So one of our attendees, Jason Brun, said, I'm nervous. No one will show up to my session. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gary, you can talk to that. That's never happened. And, 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 and Jason, it, it, will, it, it definitely will not happen because there will be people that, that will need the, the content that you're about to, to share with them because it's, uh, it, you, you have information that's going to be very, very valuable to people. And, and I agree. Yeah, I mean, it, I think everybody fears that. Um, obviously, though, with the, with the uh, online tool that we have now, you can see people signed up for your session in advance and even even start discussions in advance. So uh, if you haven't been online on the Pathable site, uh, and everybody here has gotten that invitation, so I know you have access, um, get on and take a look at your class and see who signed up for it, and, and feel free to start a discussion. It's a great tool. You should also know that we carefully designed this agenda, and you would not have been invited to speak 
any of you would not have been invited to speak if we thought that your session would not have value and merit um, and would bringing, be bringing people into your room. And Absolutely. ultimately, yeah. from into the conference. So We do take the time to do a survey in advance, too. So any session that's on our agenda is there because there was interest to begin with. So there's another question. Is Nick a professional voice for any book on tape? <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm curious who asked that question. Um, I might keep that anonymous. <laughs> you can keep it anonymous. Is it is it someone that I know? No. Oh, okay. I uh, no. I I have uh, never been a voice for for anything. And in fact, I don't even like the sound of my my voice. To be quite honest, uh, and it's something that. It can be improved. I've never gone to a voice coach because of it, but I think I, I think I should. Uh, but I am a huge advocate of of just not being monotone or trying to not be monotone and to use inflection to make emphasis. I listened twenty years ago to tapes by Zig Ziglar, one of um, the most uh, profound motivational speakers I've ever heard, and he is is beyond masterful with the use of his voice and I listened to these tapes over and over and over again whenever I went to a client site that was what I was listening to in the car and maybe just a little bit of it rubbed off but if if you want to hear someone with a masterful voice buy any audio tape that involves Zig Ziglar from Texas I agree I, I used to listen to him too he's been around for a long time and his books are still I think they still sell very very well Okay, um, there is no other questions, although uh, we did get a comment that Zig rocks. <laughs> comment. <laughs> David White not new, is he more new? I Hard to believe. Be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to believe that we're not hearing his voice. Yeah, he didn't enter that darn code. Anyway. No, no further questions, Nick. So, um, okay. Well, thank you. This was this was a fascinating and very relevant uh, webinar that you put on. Thank you for your time. Oh, you're more than welcome. I'm glad you you found it relevant. Oh yeah, and you know I, I highly recommend um, the three hour session that Nick's going to be doing on May the third. Uh, if there's any way to get there, I promise you, you will walk away with something and you will be hugely entertained. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everybody else for coming today. Go ahead. You have something else to say, Nick? No, no. Just I, I want to thank people for taking their time on a Friday, um, and I look forward to uh, to meeting them um, in uh, in Washington. Me too. All right. Thanks everybody. Have a great day, and we will see you on May third. Okay. Take care, all. Have a good weekend. Okay. Th